Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of you to one more of our, our capstone uh, leadership and design thinking uh, sessions that we're offering together with the Design Thinkers Academy Singapore. Um, before I, I share a bit about uh, this partnership and what you can look forward to as this growing knowledge community of design thinkers is uh, I want to quickly get some of the housekeeping out of the way. Uh, this is going to be a 90-minute session. Uh, we have the absolute pleasure and the honor of being able to introduce Kostu Dalgarkar and also to be able to introduce his uh, very outstanding book to all of you here today. So this is like a book launch and we want this to be a very celebratory learning process. But even before we get to that, a bit of housekeeping just so that we can make the most of these 90 minutes together. Um, so you will see, to, this is in a webinar mode. This learning is in a webinar mode. So you will see um, uh, that your uh, mics and your cameras have been uh, switched off so that we can enhance and improve the quality of the webinar learning experience. Uh, in the event that you have a challenge with the sound or with the, um, with the visuals, I recommend that you check your own connection. And then maybe if you still need some help, you can reach out to one of the organizers through the private chat. Uh, do use your chat box on the right. This is going to be very crucial to be able to make this a vibrant conversation. So we want your views and your opinions, not just your questions. There's a Q&A box that you can see uh, on your screen on top or at the bottom. Uh, do use this to post your questions as you go along, right? And now here's what we're gonna have for you today. I'm gonna to spend a couple of minutes to be able to tell you about our association with Design Thinkers Academy um, Singapore. And I must grab this opportunity to be able to um, introduce and welcome uh, Daryl, who's my partner in crime. He's going to uh, participate actively to, um, through the conversation that we're going to have with Daryl after he's introduced his book to all of you here today. Um, so the format of our conversation today is we get to invite uh, Koskuk to be able to present um, his ideas. We will then allow um, both me and um, Daryl to have an opportunity first to ask him some questions. Uh, we will involve you and bring in your comments and your questions um, during the course of that conversation and thereafter. And then we're going to allow some of you an access to be able to ask possible questions directly if you'd like to go and come into the arena, ask him a few questions, and we try and close out this uh, conversation with a few insights that we all want to record in the chat box so that we can give each other the benefit of our own insights and learning. So, um, I have a few things to share and then I'm going to hand over um, uh, to Kostov in just a few minutes. So uh, Sunit, can you help me with the deck, please? Right, so this is our launch. It was on the 10th of June, um, Capstone People Consulting. We've been doing work in the area of leadership and change, in the area of diversity and inclusion, um, in the area of um, a talent and learning. And uh, we're really delighted to be able to close the loop on uh, the work we do with organizations in the area of leadership capability, building and change by being able to integrate uh, with, um, with creative problem solving within organizations that we've been working with um, and more through design thinking. And what better partner than Design Thinkers Academy uh, Singapore? I'm delighted to introduce um, Daryl Lim, uh, the co-managing director of Design Thinkers Academy Singapore. Um, he's been doing some absolutely fabulous work in the region, and I'm excited that we add India to that region now so that we can bring the value of design thinking, uh, especially in the post-COVID-19 stage as organizations are looking to rebuild and research. This could not have been more opportune in terms of timing to be able to bring this very incredible thought leadership to India and to Indian organizations. Move forward, please. Um, about Capstone Consulting, we do work in the space of leadership and change. Most of you know about us. We have over 70 organizations that we work with already. Uh, we're also the founders of the Learning and OD Roundtable and the Women Leadership Forum of Asia. Uh, we also have a film production and a theater production company called Leopold Productions, uh, which does work in the space of um, driving societal change through theater and through film production. And of course, clinical learning, which is again, um, another very incredible, um, you know, uh, incredible vertical that does work with the sales organizations to be able to help 
drive change through the sales community. So that's about um, Capstone, and we're very excited with our partnership with Design Thinkers Academy now, which allows us to be able to drive change uh, and, and make the change stick and sustain within organizations through design thinking. Uh, move forward, please. Uh, the Design Thinkers Academy Singapore um, is one of the world's leading design-driven innovation agencies, facilitating organizations around the world to make, uh, make transition from being strictly product-oriented and sales driven towards being service oriented and human centered. Design Thinkers Academy is a global education and consultancy agency represented in 28 countries and, and it trains, develops and facilitates creative multidisciplinary teams and communities to drive uh, positive change. Uh, move forward. Uh, what does this partnership really mean? This allows us to partner with organizations that are looking to rebuild, rethink, reinvent, uh, re reconstruct, research, and we're very excited to be on the end of helping organizations reinvent themselves. Move forward. A very quick shot at what it is that our offerings really constitute. Uh, we've got some very timely leadership uh, capability building that we've been helping organizations with. A um, lot of human-centric design thinking offerings. Um, and, uh, you know, the big, uh, the big opportunity that we really have is the work that we do with intact teams to be able to help them reinvent themselves um, on the back of the current crisis, especially as all organizations now have an opportune time to be able to use this crisis well to be able to reinvent. And in fact, the book we talk about today is also an extension of that same philosophy. Move forward. Um, this is an upcoming program, and I told you watch the space for more because we have. Um, you know, a whole lot of knowledge activities. We did the Ubuntu uh, session with Robert Bloom a few days ago, and now we are incredibly excited to be able to present um, uh, the next one, which is uh, which, which is being presented with uh, Bosco Dibello. And this time around, we're in conversation with him, with Rosemary Fan of uh, Design Thinkers Academy Singapore. And this time we talk about starting from inside out, what leadership could learn from design thinking. This one's on the 3rd of July. I'm going to recommend strongly that you block this date and keep this, uh, this space to join us into another interesting conversation, which is how design thinking can actually help us bring forth the kind of leadership these times really need. So 5 to 6.30 on the 3rd, block your calendars and uh, keep watching the space for more. There's some really incredible differentiated learning opportunities. Yeah, move forward, please. And now, of course, my opportunity to introduce to you, it's logical. And uh, anyone who's known Kostub Dargalder would know that, um, you know, Kostub has the innate ability to be able to make things appear really simple. And so the book also almost uh, tells you to treat it, treat what he's saying, which is profound, but to treat it as logical. Uh, but this book talks about innovating profitable business models and the sheer opportunity um, that exists at these times to be able to reinvent business models using design thinking, especially on the back of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So like they say, never let a good crisis go waste. Uh, this is largely the philosophy of what it is that cost is asking organizations to really do by taking a good hard relook at their business model and using this opportunity to be able to reinvent uh, themselves. Uh, but I'm going to leave that and all that thunder for a uh, cost to be able to take you through what are the top lines of his book? And needless to say, uh, this, is a, this is a timely book. This is an opportune book. Uh, you know, he has brought forth his, the, his generosity of sharing um, his uh, deep thought leadership with everyone through this book. And I recommend strongly that everyone lays their hands on this book so that you have it for continuing reference. Uh, move forward. My um, great honor to introduce you to Kostub Dhargalkar. He's the author of It's Logical, innovating profitable business models. Um, needless to say, Kostov is a design thinker. He's a coach and an innovation and strategy consultant. He's also the author of this outstanding book. He has been a serial entrepreneur since uh, 1990. He founded four companies and is on to two more ventures that he's uh, find founding at this point in time. Um, in 2006, he sold his commercial interests in his first three companies and plunged into academics and research. Kostub relishes the challenge of enhancing the innovation quotient of an organization by helping creating new offerings to tap uh, both existing and new markets. 
uh, visualizing unique and sustainable business models is his forte. So not surprising, his book is called It's Logical, Innovating Profitable Business Models. Uh, we're going to let Costco take you through the top line of this book. So first of all, heartiest congratulations, uh, Dr. Costco Dargalkar. This is outstanding and we really are delighted and excited. We have the pleasure and the honor of introducing your book to everyone uh, here today. And for all those who are joining us uh, this evening, thank you for making the time. And I'm sure this is going to be an evening well spent. Uh, we will be in conversation with Dr. Kostub after he's presented this to you. But for now, over to you, Kostub. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sujaya, for that very generous introduction. Thanks, Capstan and uh, Design Thinkers Academy for taking your time out for this, uh, so to say, book launch. Uh, Daryl, thank you for taking the time out to be in this conversation. Congratulations, sir. A very big thank you to all of you uh, who have taken their time out uh, on, an, on a Monday evening uh, to listen to our conversation here. So what I will do is I will kind of take you on a short tour of uh, what I've tried to communicate through the book. The philosophy behind the book and some salient points that one can expect to pick up from it. It's logical, innovating, profitable, business models, that's the title. The name is a kind of an oxymoron of sorts. Uh, how can logic and innovation go hand in hand? Does innovation happen as a random, unexpected aha moment? Well, in 1% of the cases, it may appear to be so, but is actually not. I firmly believe that innovation happens when you train your mind to think creatively. And that's about having a mindset. A few may be born with it, but others can definitely cultivate it. Are there principles to do that? I believe absolutely yes. And I have cited plenty of real examples from my entrepreneurial and consulting experience to prove that point. In this book, each chapter begins with a story, weaves in more examples, and ends with certain points that can be applied to any business. And I refer to them as impressive impressions. Now, let me tackle the question why I chose uh, to focus on innovation in business models. Because that's a question that a lot of people have been asking me. Uh, right now, if I tell you to close your eyes and conjure up images of some cool, innovative stuff, 99% of the time, the images would range from probably a Tesla car or Google glasses or an Apple iPhone or something to do with artificial intelligence or virtual reality, augmented reality, space tech, etc. Uh, do you see a kind of a common thread in those responses? All these things mentioned fall into two categories. One is high end technologies and two is physical tangible products. That raises an obvious question in my mind. Why are we humans programmed to associate high-end technologies and physical products only with innovation? Is innovation restricted to these categories? I kind of wanted to break that stereotype and hence explore the track of business model innovation. In this book, uh, I have explored how certain companies and startups in the last say 10, 12 years have innovated on the business model and brought large conglomerates down on their knees. And that too, without really changing the final offering to the end user. How these companies created breakthroughs through innovative business models. And what can we learn from these? These are certain fundamental principles, there are certain underlying traits that we can pick up from these examples and apply to companies across domains. At the end, there is a six point framework to kind of enable the creation of unique and sustainable business models, irrespective of the domain in which a company or a startup operates. If you were to ask me what is the most striking feature of these so called new age business models, I would say it is their ability to create win-win situations for every stakeholder involved in the ecosystem. I repeat, 
it is their ability to create win-win situations for every stakeholder in the ecosystem. Only when you create win-win situations for consumers, vendors, channel partners, affiliates, basically everyone involved, you're able to create a synergy where everyone contributes their might and the entire business model not only sustains itself, but grows in geometric proportions. That's my firm belief. And these examples prove that. That brings me to another concept that I've touched upon in the book, and that is enlightened self-interest. Enlightened self-interest is a philosophy in ethics which states that persons who act to further the interests of others ultimately serve their own self-interest too. When one rises above the tunnel vision of self-interest and becomes aware of the fact that there are other stakeholders who have an interest in your well-being, and so you should have in theirs too, one begins to kind of move towards this concept called enlightened self-interest. And when we have a critical mass of corporate executives and entrepreneurs who think through this lens of enlightened self-interest, I think we'll be able to create unique and sustainable business models. I sincerely believe that it is really not that difficult for us to raise our thinking to a slightly higher plane and be able to integrate this or embed this concept of enlightened self-interest. In our ancient texts, uh, in Sanskrit, it is said, Vasudaiva Kutumbakam, literally translated means that the entire earth is one family. The entire earth is one family. It is an ancient concept from the Indian philosophy, and it shouldn't be alien to us. This concept directly translates into empathy, which is the latest buzzword doing the rounds in management circles. And in these current turbulent uh, post-COVID-19 times, more than ever, there is a strong need for reimagining the way business needs to be conducted through deep empathy and exploring win-win situations for all the involved stakeholders. That brings me to the next point which the book addresses, that is empathy. Because empathy lies at the core of human connectivity. And when that happens, everything else falls in place. So are there some simple tools by which one can enhance one's empathy quotient? Because that's the genesis of enlightened self-interest, which is the genesis of being able to create win-win situations. There are two sections in the book comprising eight chapters dedicated to stories from my consulting experiences that draw out some guidelines for enhancing one's empathy quotient. By delving deep into the user's psyche, one can easily come up with simple techniques to understand latent needs of users. There are a lot of real life stories from my experiences with large corporates, as well as mentoring fledgling startups, as well as my entrepreneurial experiences from 1990 to 2005. These techniques have kind of evolved over the last 30 years of my professional career and are evolving as we speak. Let me share some of these techniques. Technique number one, to enhance one's empathy quotient of trying to understand the user better. How can one gamify user research? Because when you get anyone to play a game, that person puts her or his most competitive foot forward. And in the process, most of the psychological guards drop down and the real choices and preferences really surface out. And as a business problem solver, that is what you need to make happen to understand latent unarticulated needs of users. And when one can consistently identify such needs, one will always be ahead of the pack. Technique number two to enhance the empathy quotient. How can one narrow down to that one bullseye question that enables you to get to the crux of what the consumers want rather than what they say? How can you narrow down on that one question? 
cut the fab around it, flab around it, and straight hit the bullseye. Because users don't have time to spend with us, we have to make the most of the short time window that we might get with them. So how to arrive at that one bullseye question is what I discuss in depth in one of the chapters. Technique number three of enhancing one's innovation, uh, one's empathy quotient. How three-dimensional ethnography helps in understanding consumer behavior. Uh, there is a case study of my work with the Mahindra group, which describes how we were able to unearth the motivations of a field employee to learn and upgrade oneself. This is a typical LNOD kind of an issue taken up there. The case talks about the team having spent two, two weeks traveling along with these executives on their motorcycles, sitting behind, understanding their lives, their families, their likes, dislikes, favorite subjects in school, most hated subjects in school, and the works, etc., etc., etc. And all this ended up to give us a lot of inputs to create a highly engaging training module for these employees. And the challenge that they had was they had a 12,000 plus workforce, feet on the street kind of workforce with great difficulty to call them to one place for training purposes. So it really had to be at a mass scalable level. And they came up with a very engaging kind of a training module with highly engaging content. That's uh, what I talk, that's what I refer to as three dimensional ethnography. The next technique, uh, how can businesses use the science of memetics to predict user behavior and visualize upcoming scenarios? Memetics is a science that sits at the crossroads of cultural studies, psychology, and anthropology that helps understand why people imitate behavior, why people behave the way they do, why people pick up some things from others and don't pick up something from others in their behavior. Very simply put, how genetics helps predict physical heredity, memetics helps predict cultural heredity. That is, why do certain groups of people behave in a similar manner? Why do they respond to certain stimuli in a certain fashion? And if, as businesses, we can understand that, I think we'll always be ahead of the curve. In chapter eight, uh, there is a case study of how during the period of 2005 to 2008, I, along with some of my students, studied the events happening in Bollywood films and sports in India back then. And we kind of predicted certain trends that actually turned out to be true uh, between the period of 2009 to 2011. Technique number five how companies should not just sell what they make, but make what might sell. I'll repeat, how companies should not just sell what they make, but make what might sell. It's a 180 degree shift in mindset and how one can kind of bring that about. Most companies work on the kind of age old system of monthly, quarterly, annual sales targets. They push what they produce. Incentive structures are based around this metric. They sell and sell and oversell, and one day realize that the consumer no longer wants what they have been making. To overcome this, how can we train executives to capture insights about user behavior that equip companies to reinvent their offerings? That is, enable companies to make what might sell. That is moving away from selling what you make to making what might sell. And all these points have been brought through, brought out through various stories. Most are about, uh, most of these stories are about what me and my clients did back then. While there are also some where the client company did not have the risk appetite for disruption and therefore did not go with the solution provided. So you have both sides of the coin there. You, the reader, can judge for yourselves whether those suggestions which were not picked up by those companies had any merit or not, or if they had been acted upon. 
would they have worked or not? Some are futuristic uh, use cases through a crystal ball that I'm sticking my neck out with. The jury is still out on some of them. Then in one, another chapter, uh, I've kind of uh, created or shared a sort of a cheat sheet for developing new products or systems or services or new business models. Uh, why? Because why a cheat sheet? Because many a time we are in the thick of operational side of business and we find time at a premium. Though we would like to do extensive user research, there are constraints on time, manpower, etc. What should one do in such situations? This cheat, uh, this cheat sheet in chapter 14 provides a framework, framework of 73 attributes that an ideal product or a service should have and can prove to be a good starting point to add features to your offering. I call it a cheat sheet because to an extent, you can kind of short circuit your user research. This framework will be handy not only while developing new products, services, systems, or business models, but also for upgrading your existing offerings. A third use case for this cheat sheet could be when you are doing a benchmarking exercise vis-a-vis -vis competing offerings in the market. This would be useful for corporate executives as well as entrepreneurs. You'll find lots of applications with real examples in this chapter, as with all other chapters. Throughout the book, the emphasis is on application rather than jargon. Uh, in one of the later chapters, chapter number 15, there is a case study on the terror attacks in Mumbai on 26th November 2008, wherein I was part of a forum involved in solving disaster relief issues that had arisen during those and after those gruesome attacks. That chapter delves deep into the process that we followed to come up with breakthrough solutions. That should convince readers that the, to the, about the fact that irrespective of the type of problem that you are grappling with, there is a broad framework which, if followed, leads, through, leads to breakthrough creations. It is a nine-step process that I propagate, and it's a combination of design thinking, FMEA, lateral thinking, analytical thinking, all of that put together. And I have kind of evolved a nine step process there, which can be applied across any domains, be it product innovation, service innovation, system innovation, even in non-business scenarios. The case study kind of summarizes my philosophy of one, user first, technology later. I repeat, user first, technology later mapping the entire stakeholder ecosystem to create win-win situations. Number three, being open to surprises in the information gathering phase. Many times, many a time, we enter the information gathering phase at the beginning of the problem solving exercise with preconceived notions. And we see everything through that lens. We interpret everything through that lens. So I propagate an open mind and being open to surprises in the information gathering phase. Point number four, be open to wild ideas, even if they seem crazy and impossible to begin with. The dots will always connect when the mind is open. Point number five, avoid bringing in technology too early in the problem solving process. There are lots of examples to prove that. And most importantly, do not begin the problem solving process with a solution in mind. Because most of us, if you really think hard, if you delve deep inside, we many a time start the problem solving process with a solution in mind. And then everything that we do is kind of corroborating whether I'm right or wrong, whether I'm right or wrong. And when, I, when you do that, you kind of get fixated with the technology and the solution and you lose kind of the objectivity while you solve the problem, which is so essential in creating breakthroughs. Uh, the book is about, uh, I don't want to scare you, but 240 odd pages of big print, don't worry. Uh, brisk reading with a lot of stories and takeaways at the end of every chapter. I think with this, uh, I will uh, stop and let's uh, open it up for questions.
You're right. Well, thank you, Kostuk. That was incredible. Very engaging. Um, you know, lots of questions already emerging uh, in my mind, and we're going to try and ask the audience as well to be able to start posting questions uh, so that we can bring you in. Uh, you know, before asking you any question, and of course, heartiest congratulations for putting this very timely book together, your cheat sheets, the stories. I'm sure all of this is going to be not just engaging reading, but very inspiring to do what these times require uh, us to do. Um, I want to start this uh, conversation with you and, uh, you know, invite Daryl to be able to come in. Sure. But I'm going to start this conversation by asking an audience poll question. So let's on the back of this, ask the audience a question. So Sunit, can we have the first audience question now, please? So I want you all to take 30 seconds to respond to this. Do you agree the COVID-19 pause is a good time to re-examine the business operating model? Do you think these, are these times are forcing organizations to reinvent and rethink? Take 30 seconds to answer this. And you don't have to agree. I know this is in a binary yes or no. And there is a socially desirable answer to this. But, um, you know, answer what you think you think is right. Is this the right time to do this? Um, I do know of clients who believe that it's not. And, um, and so you're free to not agree. Um, but do give us your binary yes or no. Do you agree these are this pause that you've been given to COVID-19 is a great time to reflect on your business operating model. Do you think these are times that are forcing organizations to be able to now reinvent, rethink what they did before COVID-19? So Neet, can we have the response here, please? So you got like 100% there. So um, Kostu, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is now quadrat demonstrandum. We told you this was timely. You have a 100% audience that believes this is the right time to be able to relook at your business operating model. So I'm going to ask you a question on the back of this. Um, and Daryl, please, uh, please join in as, as you'd like. Um, so your book speaks of the need uh, of businesses to be able to reinvent and reimagine their business models post COVID-19. Uh, tell us the circumstances in which you believe this may be a compulsion and also how empathy for the customer at each stage to create win-win situations, which you talk about. Give us like an example that brings that to life. So the first part of my question is that, um, you know, tell us the circumstances in which you believe this may be a compulsion, which is reinventing the business model. And also tell us a bit about this business of win-win situations. I mean, we talk about a lot of win-win situations. Bring this concept to life, please, by letting us know how empathy for customer can create this. Uh, see, a business has... Uh two sides. Uh, one is the demand side and the other is the supply side. Uh, every industry has taken a hit in some form or the other. It's been affected. Uh, so there has been rationalization in staffing. So there are job losses, there are pay cuts. So on the demand side, we have a kind of a cash strapped consumer. Let's get that as clear. So the composition of the spend basket of the consumer is changing and will keep on changing. As in, in the sense that a consumer would have, say, 100 rupees in the basket of his spend or her spend, say, 50 is on essentials, 20% uh, is on maybe slightly less essentials, and maybe another 10% is on, 15% is on discretionary. So the discretionary is going to come down, non-essentials are going to come down. So one needs to really understand how that shift is going to happen. But essentially, we are going to face a cash-strapped consumer. So that's the demand side. And on the supply side, uh, we have kind of uh, broken down supply chains across the world. So there are a lot of vendors lying idle with idle capacity, installed capacity, but nothing to do, so to say. So we businesses have to smartly pick up these idle capacities and you know build onto these idle capacities to create win-win situations so that you can optimize on the supply side thus bringing costs down to service a cash strapped customer who's not having much spending power how can we creatively do that that's that's my point and here is where win-win situations really need to be created and 
like for example, you know, and these uh, typically what happens when we try to look at idle capacities, we generally look either downstream or upstream in our domain itself. Either we look at our suppliers or our uh, channel partners, marketing partners, or mm. but today the situation is such that across different domains there are these idle capacities and broken mm. down kind of supply chains. Mm. Can we look beyond our domain mm. and see what kind of synergies we can bring in? Like, for example, what I'm saying is suppose you are, uh, uh, you know, an appliance manufacturer operating in somewhere in Europe. Uh, an expensive uh, labor country with uh, an outsource or with a sister or an ancillary uh, concern or company in mm. an emerging economy like ours, say, so to say. Mm. Mm. They do a typical CKD kind of, you know, assembly kind of a job. Uh, completely knock down kits come from Europe and in an emerging economy country, uh, they are assembled and sold. Now, uh, the market in the emerging economy has broken down as well as the uh, uh, Developed economy. Yeah, yeah. Now, can we, you know, can we find a partner which can, who can help cut costs, optimize our operations, and be able to create the same product at a cheaper cost? So, what I typically see is today or till February, this uh, parent company in an uh, in a developed country had a kind of a you know, a logistics partner bringing the CKD kits, completely knocked down kits to this emerging economy and an ancillary company doing the assembly in, in the emerging economy. Now, by virtue of this being the logistics company, this logistics partners has access to large warehouses across the world. So, and also in this emerging economy, they will have access to large warehouses. Now, can a partnership be worked out to utilize those warehouse spaces where one can maybe put up an assembly line mm. and cut costs, real estate costs coming down and power costs maybe might remain the same, but mm. your real estate costs come down hugely or operational costs come down hugely and you're able to use or maintain the same quality, mm. but at a lower cost and mm. also, you know, take care of the cash strapped consumer. So right. this is just one uh, point that I'm, I've been thinking about for the last two, two and a half months. How can we do that? So point uh, to conclude is that don't look for synergies just in your domain, like, you know, you know, upstream, backstream or backward integration and forward integration. These are very celebrated jargons going around. Yeah. Right. Can we look at synergies across domains? Mm. Not necessarily in your domain, because there mm. will be idle capacity lying around and we need to really look at it creatively. That's where I'm talking about the win-win situations. Right. Yeah. Daryl, please come in. Well, I, I love that Dr. Custer. Well, well, I mean, you took, you took everything right out of my mouth uh, from the very first word that you said uh, in, your, in your presentation all the way till this, this very point. And, and I think in Singapore as well, it's pretty prevalent, uh, especially when you spoke about user first, technology later. I think this is very prevalent in this era where, where there are lots of funding available and then people are doing digital transformation for the sake of digital transformation instead of just simply digitizing some of these manual works that were probably already there. I mean, I, I, I want to ask you this question. What inspired you to write all of these down? Uh, uh, into, into this book. This book is really inspirational. Uh, uh, but what inspired you? <laughs> uh, over the years, through my, so to say, avatar as an entrepreneur and starting and running a company, then as a consultant and an academic, I kind of realized that the basic tenets of running a successful business are simple, but not easy to follow. And something that is not easy to follow often gets termed as complicated. And that is the genesis of all the jargon that gets thrown around in most business circles. I would say that that was the thought or that writing a book has its origins in that thought. How can one simplify it? Because in essence, business is simple. But, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, academics, etc., especially, though I come from that space, have a habit of complicating very simple things. Uh, but at the same thing, 
the principles are simple but not easy to follow they require a lot of perseverance and a lot of grit to take them through so i think that was the uh, thought uh, origin why you know i thought of kind of putting down uh, it, putting down putting it all down in my kind of uh, this thing and as i look back on my uh, entrepreneurial career which was in manufacturing i kind of began to realize that there are lots of stories to be told there and then when i got into consulting and training assignments with large corporates in design thinking product innovation business model innovation etc i kind of began to realize that the same principles work irrespective of the size of the organization now uh, if i were to kind of cite an example uh, do we have time yeah yeah we do we yes. do most certainly yes uh, you know uh, about 3 years back uh, i was working with uh, Daimler India, the trucks mm. division of Mercedes Benz, mm. and uh, they have a very typical issue. They're great in quality, but the Indian consumer doesn't accept their price. They are about twenty percent higher than the other trucks, you know, Aishers mm. and Leyla, mm. and the fleet owner in India doesn't accept it. Mm. Um, though they are way above in performance, etc. Uh, so we were like, you know, wondering now what to do. They had kind of, you know. done all that the usual advertising and the sales calls and the sales conferences and you know training sessions for these uh, fleet owners and truck drivers etc but it was not really cutting much ice mm. uh, we were having a workshop with their sales and marketing team uh, in apps absolutely across the board right from the senior folks to the guy who actually makes the call to the dealership mm. uh, and uh, we put forth two simple principles principle one is the proof of the pudding is in eating it that's something that we know all the time mm -hmm. and two the second principle a contest with a handsome award always gives people an adrenaline push these two principles we picked up and then uh, you know on the basis of this we kind of thought and finally what we came up with was a contest called mileage marathon that was organized where in a fleet owner or an individual driver could participate in a 10 day all india multi terrain competition with daimler trucks versus the trucks that they already owned and note that the daimler trucks would be driven by their own drivers not by our specialized daimler drivers and the performance metrics were common across all the brands and uh, with this you know uh, at the with those metrics in place which was very transparent in uniform metrics uh, i think on 11 11 of the out of the uh, 13 metrics that were there these guys outperformed everybody else and so so basically i'm saying that uh, the principles are very simple uh, we somewhere get obfuscated with a lot of you know 2 by 2 uh, matrices 2 by 2 in management and that kind of uh, so you know and uh, so, and these two principles at a small level also uh, how we used we used the similar th thought of the proof of the pudding is in eating it and uh, a good contest gets everybody's adrenaline a push mm -hmm. so this uh, small uh, you know uh, uh, a franchisee selling vada pav you know that is uh, vada pav is like your burger Okay, it's a yeah. Bombay street food, a wow. delicious, hot, spicy, tangy, <laughs> name it as it. And this guy was setting up a franchised-out chain across India. And this question was, okay, I have, I have this tangy, you know, uh, spicy, hot stuff, which everybody likes. But I want, would want to not just sell that alone, but I would want to create a. a kind of a range of drinks beverages around it also and serve it at my stalls and that was his research question what beverages should i kind of serve along with this uh, hot spicy vada pav and you know then uh, he came to me and we were talking uh, initially uh, some of my i roped in some of my students 9 10 students into this kind of a project research etc initially the usual run of the mill kind of things were coming up you know we will conduct uh, questionnaire survey we will float some google survey forms and blah 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 
<laughs> and uh, we will conduct some focus group discussions x y z uh, somewhere i personally have a kind of a deep revulsion towards these direct questioning methods because people don't answer honestly i mean you know people, if you send a 40 uh, question survey to someone and expect them to spend anything more than 2 minutes on that is is kind of criminal and people just tick the boxes and you work with flawed data so what we did was at three locations in mumbai we set up kiosks uh where uh, we did some sampling and the sampling was under one condition anybody who would walk into the kiosk would be given a free vada pav hot spicy vada pav to eat under one condition that after having eaten one you have to play a game with us and at the back side of the kiosk we had set up a very simple game you know 11 beverages we, we had kept around in a semi circle and we gave each one each person after having eaten that hot spicy stuff they were given a bunch of 10 rings and they were told to you know throw a ring on the beverage that you would like to drink and if you could ring a beverage you would get to drink it and we did this for about 6 uh, odd days at these three location we collected i mean we had about something like 902 or 904 foot falls and when we put all that data together so basically it was like a weighted average right somebody yeah. trying to ring one single beverage with all 10 rings that means the choice is so much higher yeah and the students were just tally marking stuff who's putting on what and how many times is one putting on the same drink etc and uh, at the end when we put all that into an excel sheet uh, we were surprised that in the month of may in mumbai the most preferred drink was hot tea masala chai as it is called in mumbai hot tea in the month of may was the most preferred drink after having eaten a hot and spicy vada pav so that debunked uh, all our initial thoughts of maybe something cold would be preferred and things like that so what my point is the same principles of gaming work for daimler as well as a uh, as a Uh, at a very small kind of an entrepreneurial uh, venture so this my point is things are simple but we unnecessarily com- complicate them so I right I think, no i think this was incredible because what you actually defined is the value of bringing in the customer's voice yes. and not presuming what it is that you mm-hmm. think because you know it would be logical for a group of people who sat in a room to say it's a cold drink that works yeah. in the summer Uh, especially mm-hmm. since it's also a spicy dish that you're actually serving yeah. so i i mean i see i see the point that you're making and i'm going to take you back to the covid-19 times and i'm going to bring in the elements of what it is that we are experiencing right now i mean the truth is that for most organizations you know they have experienced a very significant erosion of demand during this time and you're also talking about a cash strap customer at the other end Mm. so i'm i'm uh, you know i'm tempted to uh, i'm going to ask you this question in a bit but let's ask the audience first so let's let's get a, another audience poll going sunit can you help us with that and my question this time is do you believe um, that if demand is displaced during this time but not destroyed can we go back to doing business as usual on the other side how many of you believe that demand is displaced not destroyed and therefore at the uh, after the lockdown or after uh, things have settled we can go back to doing business as usual so give us a binary yes or no we've not given you a variation on the on the scale to just simply say do you think that at this point in time we have a situation of demand being displaced for various reasons uh, it's not gone anywhere it's not destroyed uh, we can absolutely build back and go back to doing what it is that we were doing on the other side mm. All right, we've taken a couple of seconds to answer this. So, Neet, can we get the responses, please? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. This is on an opportune time. We've got fifty percent agreeing and fifty percent exactly fifty percent not agreeing. Um, this yeah. kind of makes it just so opportune to turn this question over to you, uh, Kosal. So, you know, my question to you is that uh, you know when you talk about reinventing. you know re- rethinking your business mod- model i'm just saying that for 
many organizations and I, and I work with, um, with some of them, you know, the belief is that, you know, our demand's not destroyed. It's only been displaced temporarily and it will absolutely be required on the other side. And it's not going to, and of course this varies industry wise, but um, you know, there are enough and more who believe that it's all right. It will come back over a period of time and we can write off these three or four months. So give me a response to that vis-a-vis -vis urging people to relook and reinvent their business model. Uh, well, uh, you're putting me in the category of epidemiologists. <laughs> <laughs> predicting this and that. Yeah. And most of the times uh, they uh, turn out to be economists who have been predicting a lot of things. So, but I, I honestly feel, uh, you know, things have changed. Uh, and we still don't know how they have changed. So it's best to be in the present while looking at what might happen in the future, yes. But one thing for sure is that user journeys of customers have changed. Mm. Some habits <laughs> have changed. And I don't think people are going to go to their back old habits again, at least a majority of them. You know. The obvious ones are an office space. A lot of people just think, "What? I have been functioning like this for now three months. Why do I need to go back?" But that's an. Yeah. Office. But I'm, I'm, I mean, user journeys of how customers are buying stuff, how customers are interacting with products and services, that is, that is changing, and a lot of them will stay like that. Hmm. That is, that is what one, uh, companies will have to really unravel and just not just stay in the, you know, uh, a kind of a golden uh, illumination yeah. saying that yeah. it's just a passing phase. Yeah, yeah. Not quite. I mean, plus the fear psychosis in the minds of people uh, also is going to dictate their behavior. Now, right. people going out, but uh, the moment there is some case in some locality close by, yes. what happens to that building? Yes, yeah. close down. Yeah. And then uh, you keep on thinking, oh, I visited that place. This guy must have contracted it from here and there and things <laughs> like that. No, that's what the fear psychosis, which is I am talking about. And right. uh, plus, plus logistics chains across the world. Uh, what I envisage possibly is that you know there will be some virology audits or something coming up. <laughs> where uh, a lot of these uh, uh, logistics chains will be subject to that. And that right. is an opportunity also. Right. Not just for the big four. Yes. Uh, you know, you and me, along with a virologist, uh, can sit yes. and plan, look at the SOPs, and that's an opportunity yes. coming up also, I feel. So right. There are a lot of blind spaces uh, which will emerge, come in the forefront, and uh, once these become kind of mandatory regulatory things, they're not going to go away. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We sit tight and think that business is going to come back the way it was till January, February. I think uh, in most sectors, that would be a mistaken assumption to make. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. I'm going to ask you the next question, which is, you know, you use user centricity as a terminology of your book being key to building uh, to be, being a key building block to design thinking and the application of design thinking uh, from, uh, from right from the problem identification stage. Um, so like you're rightly saying, don't come with presumed, you spoke about the lens where you come in with a solution or you come in with uh, already knowing what you believe is the problem. Um, so you're trying to ask uh, people to come in with, um, um, you know, with, a, with user centricity, which means a lens to be able to understand the user from the beginning and being in an exploratory stage rather than coming with kind of presumed, um, you know, uh, foregone conclusions into the entire process. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about user centricity and how you use it in the context of design thinking. Are there examples, stories, cases? I do see on the chat as well, there is a huge ask to say, can you give us examples? Can you give us stories? Uh, I, okay. I mean, I will start with uh, my business itself way back in the 90s, early 1990, I got into my own uh, entrepreneurial venture. Uh, we used to manufacture presses. Presses as in, you know, 
mechanical presses, those hand-operated yeah. presses, which are typically yeah. used on an assembly line on top of a table to do operations like punching a hole or marking your logo on some finished object and things like that, you know, do some riveting operations and things like that. Now we started off, we designed it, we manufactured it, we started selling it. Now we started getting good, uh, a good traction in the market as well. But in the first, uh, you know, after a year and a half to two years of the launch, I kind of realized that people are not coming to me to buy a press. They are coming to me to enhance the productivity of their assembly line. Right. And the moment, like, moment we understood that, the natural extension to our product line was automated conveyor belts, mm. indexing tables, you know, pick and place units like miniature robotics back then, I'm talking about the mid nineties or, you know, automatic feeders where the jobs, where the components come automatically. So basically the customer was not coming to me to buy a press, but the customer was coming to me to enhance the productivity of his or her assembly lines. That means he wanted or she wanted to do double the output with the same manpower mm. or maybe reduce the manpower and maintain the output. So that realization, when it came, our product line kind of changed. And initially, we did not have the technology to manufacture all that in-house, the other products. So we started tying up with people and things like that. And, but we started giving end-to-end -end solutions. And in five to seven years, our entire product, full, pro, product portfolio changed completely from just a normal press manufacturer mm. to an automation uh, kind of, you know, company. Yeah. Involved in upgrading productivity of the assembly lines of clients. And the client base also changed. I mean, earlier we used to, uh, you know, supply to small manufacturers. Later on, Tata Motors and Aisher and, you know, the switchgear companies, automobile companies, etc. became our customers. And I think uh, 10 years later, we had an actual offer from a German and an American company for a tie-up. Now, I don't think that would have happened had had we kept on making those presses. Yeah. yeah. So that understanding of why is the consumer coming to me and what is the solution that he or she is seeking. Right. You know, we could have continued making presses, better presses. Yeah. You know, yeah. We could have made, you know, servo motor control presses, etc. Which we yes. did. But yeah. if we had been stuck with that, that would be a typical classical case of sticking to your core competence. Right. Rather than redefining your business from the user's perspective. Right. So that's, that's, that's my point here. Right. No, I think I'm going to, I completely, uh, I mean, it's a lovely example and thank you for sharing it. I'm going to, at this point, ask you a memetics question, right? Um, and, but I'm going to ask the audience that question first, uh, which is, um, so can we have the next audience poll up here? Yeah? I'm going to ask this question around the word empathy and whether we talk more as a community about it rather than manifest it when it comes to work. So do you believe as a community, we like, talking about empathy, we believe we understand what is empathy, but we don't know how to manifest that in work. Do you believe we spoke, speak more about high empathy for user or customer than real work to back this espoused belief? So we, we, we link a memetics question to Kostub on the back of this, which is, do you believe as a community, we talk about high empathy, uh, but we don't know how to manifest it in our work, which is when it, we don't really have empathy for a customer, we don't really have empathy for the user, Finally, when it comes to any form of process improvement or problem solving, um, you know, it can lapse into, um, into uh, you know, one-upmanship, it can lapse into blame games, it can lapse into all kinds of other cultural challenges rather than actually uh, putting customer at the center of everything it is that we really do. So let's see what we got from here, uh, Sunit. Can you put up our responses on this? Okay, you have a staggering 82% of green with this. Um, that we speak more about empathy than we have the ability to really show empathy uh, for the customer. So question to you, Kostav, on the back of that, you have a very staggeringly large number of people who agree that we talk about it, but we don't really yeah. put it to practice. And like I was saying, you know, if you look at meetings, you know, for problem solving inside organizations, 
uh, everyone just likes to talk about the problem and some more about the problem and some more about the problem and then talk more about the problem. And it's also therapeutic just talking about the problem. And yeah. uh, we often don't arrive at the solution. You know, the whole meeting's about the problem. Again, if we start talking solution, uh, the tendency to be able to quickly find somebody as the hook on which you want to hang the coat because mm -hmm. it will show somebody in poor light because there's a problem. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. an organization that uh, started something uh, which was a life problem solving process, which is, um, you know, there was an expatriate uh, manager who came in on board and he was really aghast to see that the organization had problems galore, but no one really taking the initiative to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. And he realized that there seemed to be a challenge because he thought maybe there isn't a process to solve problems. And he said, all right, well, you know, I'm going to take the initiative. And he said, maybe perhaps what you have is a challenge because, um, you know, maybe people don't know how to navigate the system to be able to get the approvals to change anything so that we are able to solve the problem. So as a senior person, let me take charge of this and let me put a kind of a room together where other senior people gather together and you know, we solve a problem. There is four or five of us, we come together, we take a problem statement and we solve a problem. And so uh, they started this and they didn't get too many takers. So they said, all right, let us find four or five problems and we solve them and show people how to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And we tell them, we're right at the back of you, we won't ask you all the uncomfortable questions for example, why have you been living with this problem for so many years? Or why haven't we seen the solution in the right light? Why have we not spoken to the right people to get the approval to be able to execute whatever changes required in the back of the problem solving? So we won't ask no questions. You can just come in, we'll navigate, we'll find solutions. After, after demonstrating and prototyping five problems which they really solved for the organization, they, 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 were, they were back to square one, twiddling their thumbs, nobody came with problem number six. And so they never had problem number six, they don't have problem number seven. That's when they went back to say, what is our challenge? Why do people not come up and express a problem? And, uh, and so I want, want to take you back to this and give me a memetics answer on this one, which is, are we as a community people who love to sit on problems? Mm -hmm. Are problems a way to admit to underperformance? And so we don't want to admit to problems. Are problems about blame games? Are solutions about one-upmanship? which is part of the reason why you don't get the kind of collaborative energies that you want for problem solving. Do you believe that the COVID-19 times with people with their back against the wall are going to bring forth, which is already visible inside organizations, which is distributed authority, people working together, more collaboration than ever before. Do you believe you're going to see that? What is your, what is your knowledge of memetics telling us about our ability to truly have the gumption to solve problems? I think that, Let's, for the time being, let's keep memetics out of it. Yeah. We'll talk about yeah. it. But yeah. what I feel is, as a, you're, this is a, you're talking about our country specifically mm -hmm. about Indians and our yeah. problem, our attitude towards problems. Problems. I think you know it goes much deeper than that. Uh, see the way we are brought up. We are brought up in a, in a, in an environment where there are only hundred admissions and there are hundred thousand applicants. So we want to be right all the time. We don't want to go wrong. Mm. We don't want to experiment and lose that lose one of those hundred seats. Mm. We don't want to experiment with an approach which might take us away from those hundred seats. Mm. So you know, education, right from the education and everything else around, because of the large population that we have, we don't want to be wrong for the fear of missing out on that limited, you know, uh, limited resource available. Possibly that's, that's what gets inculcated and that's what comes out in organizations also. Mm. The boss is not willing to accept the mistakes of the subordinate. And hence the subordinate is not wanting to experiment, not wanting to try out some lateral methods of approaching the same problems. Everybody wants quick fixes. And then I think we are also very sales driven rather than marketing driven. Mm -hmm. Most of our companies are wanting to meet quarterly targets, monthly targets, etc., etc., etc. I'm going to make a comment which some people may not like. Mm -hmm. That also is because of this possible American culture of ESOPs mm -hmm. where a senior executive is given ESOPs 
and a contract for three years or so. Hmm. And his ESOPs or her ESOPs are directly proportional to the stock market share price. And the stock market share price depends on quarterly results. Bottom lines. And the bottom line kind of gets affected because the senior fellow got involved with R&D. Temporarily, the bottom line goes down. Hmm. And that's what I don't think people want that to happen. So it's top down, that thought process com comes in. Bijo, hmm. sell, 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 hmm. sell. Quarterly hmm. results. You know. hmm. Next hmm. town hall, we must show a 15% hike in bottom line and some 10% hike in sales revenue, whatever. Hmm. Hmm. So fundamentally, I think uh, that uh, latitude for experimentation just gets yeah. Yeah. Everything gets blinkered. Yeah. So you think that you can be risk averse as a result of yeah. this. Yeah, and uh, if, you, if you went into fixed mindset, growth mindset, you know, yeah. we have by and large, we get, we've been rewarded for fixed mindsets in the past. So we stay with that. And that's what we demonstrate in senior positions, inability to want to take up a challenge, inability to want to take the effort to learn something new, uh, very worried about making mistakes and not looking good in front of people, all of that. And I think the larger culture also makes you behave in a particular manner. So you're, you're, you kind of responded in short to say that, you know, there are cultures that are risk averse and there's too much at stake to want to experiment and to want to explore. It's you know, I'm mindful of time. Changing. Yeah. It is yes. But it should. It is changing. It is changing. faster, I feel. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I really believe that COVID-19 times is our accelerator for exploration. And uh, it's going to be our accelerator to be able to get people to kind of take more risks. And you're already beginning to see that within organizations. So I'm, I'm kind of very gung-ho about this being like the accelerator uh, for change. But I'm mindful of the time, Kostub and Daryl. So I'm going to take some of the questions that are up here for you. Yeah. And there's some really wonderful questions. Um, you know, you said, uh, Kostub, in your talk right at the start, you said, make what might be sold. Uh, the question Anil Jain is asking is, is not this against the concept of creating new markets or creating blue ocean? So if you start with, I want to, I want to, make something that will be sold. He's asking, does that kind of limit your blue ocean um, sort of strategy to kind of, rather than being restricted with what will be sold, to be able to be more sort of exploratory, more, more experimental in, uh, at the starting point? Yeah, I mean, see, many a times we have an approach of, we have this product and it has to be sold. So go and sell it. So the latent unarticulated needs of users kind of get the secondary treatment. Yeah. I have something, you're putting something down somebody's throat through some great advertising, through, you know, X, Y, Z, ABC, some discounts and things like that. But in the long run, that approach kind of short circuits growth. No? Right. So, like for example, I'll give you an example. I was working with uh, kind of an MSME, uh, MSME 2012, 2013. This person was in the business of uh, jewelry export, 100% jewelry export, operating out of an SEZ in Mumbai. And mm -hmm. this guy was a B2B supplier to most of the big brands around in the world, Prada and Swarovski and David Gurman and all those guys. And he had run this business for 20 years and he always used to feel, feel that for a slight design change, I have to take approval from these big shots. I can't bring my designs to the world. So this, and he wanted to start his own brand. He was retiring and two of his kids were taking over the business. So he had given himself a three year timeline that before I retire, I will create a brand of our own so that we'll somewhere become B2C and not just remain B2B. And we were generally chatting up in 2012, etc. cetera. Uh, how does one go about it? So for some fundamental questioning we did, Simple question that we asked was, what business are we in? Initial answers were we are in jewelry business, we are in the sports business, we are in the manufacturing business. They had a fantastic uh, manufacturing unit at par with anything that you might find in Japan because they had built it up with, uh, with uh, a lot of consul Japanese consultants coming in. Finally, after a lot of questioning, we came to a conclusion that we are not in the business of jewelry manufacturing. We are in the business of fashion because 
lady buys jewelry to look and hence they are in the business of fashion now when this came up outlook of all those people just changed and when they were looking at launching this brand to get manpower they stopped looking at poaching from their jeweler jeweler competitors but they poached from zara and rolex and all those kinds of people and their that sales channels also changed it came out of gold soups went next to an apple store went next way start had channels through some you know high end golf clubs fine dining restaurants and stuff like that so their approach changed so my point is if you are able to put yourself in the shoes of that customer and understand from that perspective businesses can actually change uh, yeah yeah and what happened one more thing i'll add to that story is we did a study of how a western woman 27 to 38 year old western woman who was a typical target consumes fashion and we got mm-hmm. the that 42% of her fashion wear is bought online and these guys were not present online at all okay and the question was uh, will people buy expensive stuff online so we commissioned a little more commission yeah? we did some analytics on google and we figured out that 490 dollars is kind of a limit that that person swipes back then mm-hmm. so then then we sat down with these people and gave their entire product portfolio which used to cost about 1200 to 1500 dollars earlier they sat with designers from across the globe and made a portfolio which was between 375 to 475 480 dollars and after 3 years their online business was about 37% of the total turnover right so point is these shifts yeah yeah has to come from the top and it right. will come only when we really are able to put ourselves in the shoes of the consumer what is yes from us right right you know i'm going to pass the next question on to um, daryl and you. daryl <laughs> i have uh, professor vejanti pandit who is continuously posting on uh, both the Q&A box and this she wants to know and hear from Singapore from the Singaporeans who she says are the epitome of innovation customer centricity and the rest of that can you share some insights can you share some stories on um, on the topic of um, you know what we're talking about today which is you know putting empathy and customer centricity right at the center of everything so give us some design thinking insights and uh, and and stories Uh, we don't have a lot of time so we can perhaps yes. take one story but you know tell us something we've got a demand here on saying we have somebody from singapore right here on the panel can we get his insights on the subject okay. uh well well i i i first and foremost i would like to i, I would like to well i i totally affirm uh, what uh, uh, dr kaustub has been saying the whole time uh and and i strongly believe that i mean uh, just purely based on also my my own experiences with businesses in singapore and uh, associations and government agencies i think we have reached kind of like a saturation point and covid happens to be that trigger for us to get into a reset of the whole system uh well when 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 uh, dr kastup spoke a bit about uh, the example of the uh, the esop i'm thinking this is an opportune time for organizations to reframe what it means by bottom lines right what does it mean by bottom line is it any more about that money that is brought in or is it is it a new indicator that organizations might need to think about uh, a while ago you also spoke a bit about uh, uh, education and 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 uh, i think we are now in a sense victims of our own success in our lives we have always been taking the easiest way the way, easiest way to get success and therefore i think we are not any less creative today i think we are making choices not to be creative what do you think well in 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 singapore i mean even in singapore when organizations talk about innovation it is always about reducing something but producing the same outcome receiving the same amount of money right that that equals to productivity gains right or uh, reducing that manpower so that uh, some some technology can get uh, uh, introduced and then reduce its costs but where is these uh, disruptions and where are these creative new inputs that we are we are kind of 
losing out today? Uh, that, that, that's something I, I mean, Dr. Kaustuk, what's your take on this? That, that's where that, you know, that a high empathy quotient with your end users, that's where it will come out. You know, I mean, somebody, there's an interesting point which I often get asked, Mr. Madan has put it up there, that uh, 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 if somebody had asked Henry Ford, uh, should I make uh, a vehicle? People would have said, no, I need faster horses. I mean, 90% of the talks that I go to, I get asked this question when I talk about empathy quotient. Well, my point is that people wanted a faster mode of trans transportation. They did not know that uh, an automobile is a faster mode of transportation back then, uh, decade and twenty, uh, a century and twenty years back, uh, early nineteen hundreds. People wanted to move fast, but their frame of reference was a horse. But Henry Ford realized that latent need of wanting faster transportation and adapted a technology which existed back then and kind of productized productized it and made transportation faster for the common man through and cheaper and affordable through his assembly line techniques, which made products cheap. So understanding the user is not something that Henry Ford short circuited, did not bypass that. He understood the user wanted faster transportation and at an affordable rate, so he kind of married the existing, then existing technology of an IC engine into an, into an automobile. So, unless one has a strong empathy with the user, mm -hmm. businesses will not be able to reinvent. And that's where real disruption will happen. When you really figure out those latent unarticulated needs that people have, but they don't speak. Like for example, even when we grew up in the 80s, 70s, 80s, our parents also used to be worried if we did not return home by 8, 8.30. But they didn't have a mobile phone to connect with us. Right. So the need of connection, did, did you, do you think the need of connection did not exist in the 80s? It did exist. Motorola understood that and modified their old wireless technology into what we today call as a mobile phone. So it's not about direct questioning of customers, of users, but it is intuition and observation and intuition put together that yes. will really help reinvent and that's what sometimes is missing and that's what i mean by enhancing the empathy quotient of every damn individual in your organization yeah that's what design yeah. Good really point. Important. right um, so i have a question here uh Kostub, uh you know it's a it's a by the by question but it's an important one uh it's from abhay and he's asking he's telling you that the reason why you got tea as the most preferred drink with um, a spicy vada pao is because yeah. people prefer having hot tea after having oily food item because of the myth that it clears the throat from the oil. Okay. Uh, what was the second preferred drink? He's interested in knowing what was the second preferred drink. The second preferred drink came was uh, chas, buttermilk. Yeah. yeah. Again, contrary, yeah. something hot and something not so hot. So. Right. And, and right. I, I would also like to make a point that what we found in Mumbai should not mm. be blindly copied in Delhi. Mm. I have to do another research mm. there. So that yeah. to be contextual. Many times we find one result and then we try, want to scale it up. And yeah. scale it up is a big word nowadays. So right. In the startup circle, you want to scale up. But we want to remain topical as well as uh, maintain scale. So how does that happen? That's a tightrope walk to make. Right. Right. You know, I'm going to, uh, at this stage, you know, we're almost at 627 and it's almost time to say goodbye, but I cannot, but uh, close this without asking you, um, you know, an important, uh, okay, he, uh, you know, Madan saying meanwhile that you got chance as your chance is the local word for buttermilk, by the way. Yeah. So you got chance as your second uh, choice because it's a cultural preference to drink chance. So maybe the north, there's more of chance and that here, maybe you have more of the garam jai. So, and also the myth that it clears the throat of oil, as he's pointing out. So, good things to be able to more and more empathy here and more and more observations here, which is great. And these are myths that we need to uncover. We yeah. corporations mm -hmm. don't know these myths. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, you know, empathy yeah. and understanding helps.
<laughs> right. You know, I have to ask you this question, Kostub, before letting you go. And I'm just interested to know, uh, especially for considering that for a long time when we spoke about innovation, we really meant product innovation for the longest time. And it's taken its while to be able to look at services and, and other concepts. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm keen to know that for, um, and because you belong primarily to the manufacturing, um, you know, uh, sort of your, most of your un entrepreneurial ventures and your work is in the space of manufacturing. I have to ask you this question for a group that has traditionally been the closest to innovation, what took so long for smart industrial, um, industrial revolution 4.0 to unfold um, in this particular group? Why did it take so long for manufacturing to marry digitization? It's happening now. I mean, uh, 4.0, everybody's talking about it, but there are also, you know, the other side is that uh, downsizing is happening because of smart machines, smart. Uh, yeah. So there is a lot of, uh, regulatory, uh, you know, uh, resistance to it also, unions, I mean, manufacturing industry is the most organized in terms of trade unions. And that is also slowing that down to a large extent, especially in culture. So that's one point. Also, uh, some decision makers also might lose jobs. That also yes. is is there. So that also slows down the whole decision making. Yeah. So quickly, I, you know, these two points come to my mind. Yeah, yeah. But it is, it is kind of intriguing, isn't it, that the people who bring innovation to the product did not bring innovation to themselves. And especially in a conversation where we're looking at uh, reinventing uh, the business model, reinventing how we go about doing what it is that we have been doing traditionally. Um, of course, it's great that it has unfolded. I, you know, it's kind of a so little... I, I go back uh, 2002, 2001, you know. Yeah. We used to make these special purpose machines where we had introduced a SIM card back then hmm. where, wherein if the machine broke down, a text message would go to the maintenance and the production manager. Hmm. So back then in 2000, yeah. 2002, this was something different, new. We had introduced this in the controller. And we thought, wow, fantastic. Yeah. You know, really make ripples in the market. The feedback that we get, you know, is that production and the maintenance guy tells the CEO, this damn machine breaks down at 3 o'clock in the morning. At 2.30 in the morning. You know where yeah. it's coming from? Yeah. I have to go wake up and go down to the shop floor. Right. <laughs> we thought this smart way of working would actually be good, but we never got orders back then from this yeah. 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 You know what I mean? The Western. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. 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 But you know, I'm glad we spoke about this and you know, you've just been so candid and um, so full of generosity to share. Thank you so much for doing that. Yeah. Daryl, thank you for bringing in your perspectives. This has been splendid and we really enjoyed talking to you. Um, Kostu, uh, many more successes to you and to the book and to everyone who's joined us here today. Um, you know, I think you'd be doing yourself a service by buying this book and using it as a already referenced, very timely, uh, an actual book that's been written in COVID-19 times and it's here to be able to help organizations think differently. Daryl? You know, it's only logical to get the book at this time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's only logical to buy, it's logical. So thank go you. ahead, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming in on board. We enjoyed this conversation. Watch the space for more from the Capstone Organization and Design Thinkers Academy uh, Singapore. We will keep you regaled each time with new learning. Third, um, don't forget the third July session. Um, this time we explore what design thinking can learn from leadership and what leadership can learn from design thinking. So um, uh, keep uh, in touch with the conversation and keep it going. And do not forget to buy It's Logical uh, by, by Dr. Kostub Dhargalkar. And congratulations again, Kostub, and thank you for coming in on board for this conversation with us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sujaya. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Thank Captain. you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Yeah, be safe. Be safe, everyone. And thanks. Thank you for joining in today. Thank you.